on this week's show discussing managing change and innovation with Will McManus from DSI. In this week's news, a rebuttal, JP Morgan Chase, big investments, and more. All right, we're here. We're back. I've got Sean McGuire with me. Sean, how are you doing? I'm doing well, man. We were back from you know the break. I'm back from convention. Doing nice. Got got re-energized seeing all of our members this last couple of weeks down in uh, in Arizona, and I am fired up. Yeah, you've been lighting up LinkedIn, man. I love the videos that come out. All the people talking about their first times there. I remember my first times there. It's a it's an awesome show. It's an awesome time, man. Yeah, I mean every single time, and it's crazy. It's a there's different like uh, little communities kind of throughout the year that I, I visit, but the 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 leadership that kind of comes to our convention every year is a great one to reconnect to. And it's, it's almost like a family reunion um, because you have seen people you, you, you've been, I've been seeing for the last 20 years in the industry coming back year after year. So it's great to, to catch up every time. That's awesome. And you brought us a guest today. Will, Will, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I'm here from um, the Austin, Texas area and glad to be a part of it. Ah, beautiful Austin, Texas, a little area that's growing it's, pretty quickly, it's, huh? It's beautiful, right? That's because right. You're, you're, um, you're in Buda, Texas, which is outside and it's pronounced, it's, it's yep. spelled B-U-D-A, but it's pronounced Buda, right? Buda. Yes, you've got to say it the right way. Good job, Sean. Long U, Texas style. That's uh-huh. right. Yeah, long you Texas style. Well, normally this is where we say we're going to be right back with you, Will, and we're going to pause for the cause. But before we do that, Sean, you have a little information for the pause for the cause this week, don't you? So kind of cool. What we've been doing lately, uh, we have these little poker chips that we developed with uh, between MCA, Nika, Talk, and Spagna. It's uh, Mental Health Matters. Uh, it's okay to not be okay, but we've been developing these things, and all four associations are trying to get uh, these down throughout their entire memberships. Uh, but on the back of it, it has a little 988 suicide hotline uh, thing just to just kind of get the word out that there is a national health line that people can call uh, to talk to real professionals about it if, if you need help in any kind of way. So we have them available. Uh, we've been distributing them both through our regional associations uh, between the four associations and our trade partners. Uh, it's great to see everybody sharing that. And that 988 is the number. If you ever need anything, you can text it, you can call it, you have it on your mobile phone and you know it. So now thanks, Sean. And thanks for MCAA, Nika, SMACNA, Talk, everybody doing that. It takes the whole industry leaning in. And that's why we pause for the cause. So I'm here with Christina Henkai, who's put together a first of its kind event that's going to integrate learning and innovation with play. Tell people a little bit about you and why you started this event. Over the years, when I'm going to all these different construction conferences and stuff, I'd always find at least one new connection where I found out something amazing they were doing. And it was like so cool and it was making so much impact and it was effective for project and no one knew about it. Most of us are tired of some of the same old, same old ways. We're looking for something new. We're looking for something innovative that's not just talk and pretty, but actually actionable. And so that's why I I made sure that it's focused on workshops specifically. When you go, you're gonna find people that are, you know, on the spectrum of where they are in the journey of trying to do continuous improvement or any other buzzword that you want to use, but improve our industry. Who do you think should be going this? Who, if they're listening in, who should come to the event? Yeah, I think anyone that has has ever had an idea of like, you know what, it shouldn't be this way, or we can do this better. This is a place where you'll go. And all of that curiosity and creativity will be sparked. You'll learn from some people that are further along in that journey where they have an exercise already that they're working on with project teams and you can collaborate with them. It's only gonna be 40 people. So every single person you meet, I think is gonna come from a different aspect of our industry. Awesome. So when is it and where's it gonna be? It is one full day jam-packed with workshops on Wednesday, June 14th in Austin, Texas. How do people sign up? It's my website, so so built with the T at the end and .com slash play 
or you can message me and I will just get you all set up. Easy peasy. Hey, remember, we're on YouTube, so you've got to get in there and subscribe. That's right. It's youtube.com forward slash at the contact crew. We're back. We've got shorts. Who knows? We might even start putting in some new video content that you're only going to be able to see there. So if you wanted to see Sean's chip, well, you're going to have to tune into YouTube. So pop on over there and click that subscribe button and get notified of every new episode and every new short. I'm here with Robert Shear, VP of Strategy and Business Development for OpenSpace. Robert, tell us a little bit about what is OpenSpace. OpenSpace is a 360 job site capture, review, and tracking tool. Think of it as an up-to-minute Google Street View of your project that people can view anywhere, anytime. Some people also refer to it as like total project recall, right? So what if you could have a photographic memory for all your projects for all time in case something came up in the future? So that's really what it is. Hey, how do you use it? Let me grab my camera. You simply just attach a 360 camera to your hard hat, open our app on your phone, open the floor plan, tap where you are and walk. We take care of the rest. So as you walk, we take uh, two 360 images per second. You come back, upload them to the cloud, and we process that all together, stitch them together, pin all those images to your plans, and deliver it back to you as the inevitable 360 environment for everyone to use and share. And typically, we deliver it back to you in like 30 to 60 minutes. And we are back. All right, Will McManus, I am excited to sit down and talk to you. DSI has been at the forefront of innovation of a lot of things going on, but there's there's some wizards behind there that have really crafted this. So I wanted to I wanted to sit down and talk to you a little bit about the history, give everybody an understanding of who you are, but also you know what you guys uh, you know the philosophy going on over there at DSI. I really appreciate you uh, having me on the show and giving me an opportunity to talk about DSI. I, I, I feel like I play a uh, actually a fairly you know small role in this thing, and I've got a just a tremendous team of people who do really good work for uh, this company, and it's uh, we've been fortunate to see some of it even spill over you know into the industry, and it's 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 been a, it's been a good ride. Um, we're not a very old company, and I feel like one of the things that you know, we've done well that has uh, separated us, if you will, is thinking about what it takes to be that next level of contractor. What what does it take to make that that leap from, say, a small to a medium and now to what, you know, is turned into a pretty large company? And the, the, the background of this thing is, just talk about DSI's philosophy in general is, family and customers. And we take that very seriously. We, we really do believe that people that work here are part of a family and we treat our customers the same way. Most of our work comes from repeat customers. We're not just chasing the next job, but uh, we really do embrace what our customers want and deliver an excellent product to them. So where does that take us as far as like innovation? Well, the construction industry is historically been like laggards, right? Like we're always kind of just right before the farmers do something, we'll, we'll figure it out, right? So <laughs> it, it's, but we, we've seen though, and especially the last, I don't know, let's go back eight years or so, um, the things that other industries have gotten through were knocking on our door. And we're not, I'm not getting into the weeds of all those things, but we started talking about seeing this change coming that was right in front of us. And, and we knew it was going to be there. And our philosophy needed to change. It couldn't just be about doing the same thing and expecting the same results. But if we didn't change, if we didn't adapt and begin to embrace um, I'm going to say the, the rapid change. We've always thought ourselves as leaders in technology, but it was moving so slowly, it was pretty easy to keep up with. Suddenly that change was coming rapid fire. And we knew that uh, we needed to be in a position to be adaptable, um, to be able to get our, our field folks involved and all of those things. But we had a foundational issue in our opinion. And it's it's a it's a boring topic to talk about, um, but depends on who you're talking to. Uh, that's true, but I, I say boring. It's more well. I'll just stick with that word foundational. We 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 had an ERP, and we had the same one we had since the beginning of time. It was literally twenty 
three years that we had been using that, that same system. Comfort level's high, knowledge level is high. I mean, you knew that thing inside and out. But, but I sat down with our um, financial leadership teams and, and basically said, look, it's not going to take us to the next level. We've got to do something different. So in towards the end of 2014, uh, we made the decision to make a change to that ERP. And it took us, you know, 18 months or so. And so in January of 2016, we went live on um, our new ERP. And we had to do that. None of the other things that we were going to do were going to be successful if we did not have that solid foundation to build on. So when I get an opportunity to talk to other, you know, corporate executives, technology or not, it doesn't matter. You know, one of the things that I like to talk to them about is understand the, what's really the underpinnings of who you are as a company with your technology. Get all the way down to the very bottom of this thing before you before you build up, because if you don't, it's going to break. And well, so and you've got to have something strong. That's the interesting part, because, you know, like Sean said, it's it, it depends on who you're talking to. Remember, I did three years and have done yeah. I have He's done, done <laughs> ERP rip and replaces for a number of different reasons. That's why Jeff's as crazy as he is now. I mean, he's done enough ER. Like, you, have you talked to people who've done two ERP replacements? They're they're <laughs> usually like on the on the tip of sanity. Yeah, um, right. Because it is a it is an endeavor. And and but what I'm interested in is as I've been in that room, it's rare to see someone go into that room, and I'm interested into what that conversation because people, you know, they're like, oh, we, you know, the high comfort level, the the ability, but also like there's this comp common misconception, right? Accounting practices really haven't changed necessarily. And so a lot of that foundational stuff hasn't changed. So what were you able to point to, to get the team to start to understand, oh, wait, there is a lot more to this. And this is so critical because I know there's groups out there right now that are going, absolutely not. You're not touching it. We recognized that data from all facets of our business needed to be brought together so that we could make sense of what was happening. So we, we had too many silos of things. We had project management data, we had accounting data, we had field data, but there was no methodology really of bringing all that together without a significant amount of manual processes. And we were getting too big uh, for that to make sense anymore. You couldn't just keystroke all that stuff in. And I tell you, when I, it's almost embarrassing to think about how many times we were typing the same information in, in each one of those silos so that each group had the same set of data. And we had to call time out on that. And we said, look, if we're going to grow to the next level, and we had a vision of growing to that next level of contractor. And we said, we've got to do better. We've got to get these things uh, brought together. So the first uh, gap that we needed to bridge was project management and finance. And we basically said, look, accounting's got their processes. It, it's blocking and tackling. They're super good at it. Uh, but we want to give them even a better system. We feel like we did that. But now we've brought all of the financial aspects of what our project managers were doing, change orders, uh, accurate job cost tracking, all of those things were now happening live on the same system. And it, it, it brought like a sense of immediacy to being able to analyze where we're at on the job. I mean, one of the best examples I can give you is accounting used to send out like a monthly packet. Actually, some of it went out weekly and it was on, it was a PDF and it got emailed to them, uh, project managers, and, and they would look at it. And literally that was the, the, the Bible for them of where they were on a job. But for that, that month or for that week, yeah. yeah right. They don't even look at it now, right? So we may still send it, but they don't even look at it. Why? Because they're, they're in the system and they're seeing the data as it happens uh, and they can make better, faster decisions that help us as a company. Right. They can make tactical decisions as opposed to like the long strategy decisions that you're seeing for like one month or, or one quarter or whatever. You're ripping off a bunch of scar tissue for me there. I, I, I have I seen many it's, of those reports. You know, what's yeah. crazy is like we're, we're talking ERP and, and I know when people hear that, it's like, you know, have you ever seen like a little kid jump off the top of the jungle gym and you, your, your knees feel it? Like you cringe seeing it. And you're like, oh man, my knees hurt just seeing that kid jump off the top. A lot of people will, will start hearing ERP 
and they're going to cringe a little bit, almost like that. But we are going to talk tech beyond this. But yeah. one of the reasons why we want to focus on this is because this really is, you have to talk about the foundation. And it's hard to make some of the bigger, you know, shinier, you know, stuff, decisions on, on some of the, the, the day-to-day kind of software until you get some of the, the foundational stuff, like, settled and underway. Right? I mean, that, that's how you kind of see it, Jeff, right? Oh, it, it, it's absolutely that way. And there's this, there's this total misunderstanding that like somehow in the innovation and the fact that accounting is blocking and tackling that they're not like a part of this. And it's like, no, 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 that, that foundation is holding up everything we do because if we don't make money, if we're not profitable and we can't pay those paychecks, then we're not an organization anymore, right? It doesn't really matter how innovative with laser scanning or prefabrication or doing anything if we can't pay the bills, if we can't provide for our customers, if we don't know how we're doing. So you, you kind of have to take it back. And it's interesting, too, because there's a huge data conversation right now, Will. And so many of them are trying to solve it with APIs. They're trying to solve it with new solutions. And it's like, you, you, have, to, you have to go to that deep, dark area, don't you? And look yeah. at that. Absolutely. There are a few things that will um, kill a construction company and failure to manage your accounting practices appropriately has got to be near the top of the, of the pile, whether it be cash management, accurate billings, payroll mistakes, whatever those things are, it can, it can get out of, out of hand fast. And so all of those things are super, super important. But so we, we, we had a great team. They took care of that. We've now bridged that gap. And as far as that piece of where we are, we're, we're super happy. We're several years in now. Uh, we're, we, we, we've got that covered and, and now we can take all of those other things that we want to do. I mean, there are still areas that we, we look out across our enterprise and we're like, man, we got to fix that. But we've got all the elements in place to where we, we can, you know, you can't go out to me and do things like AI implementation for whatever you want to do. And, you know, cause that's the fancy buzzword these days. And, and you, you can't do that if you don't have a clear understanding of both your philosophy as a business around innovation and that you've got those solid things that you can fall back on if something were to fail. Because we, we, you know, we, we've tried many things that didn't work and, and we're not afraid to, to fail forward, as they say. Um, my other yeah. thing I would say about failure, by the way, is just fail fast. <laughs> don't, don't wait too long to pull the, pull the plug and go, that, that didn't work and move on to something different. So. I, well, I know Sean's going to want to jump on that, but I'm going to tell do. you, I have done this for years. There are so many of you out there dragging a giant boat anchor with you that is holding you back that Will's referring to. And I, I will tell you now, it is the, you know, it's the sacred cow, if you want to call it. And we used to say this when we went in, there are no sacred cows anymore. And nine times out of 10, it's some software someone created that's still there that it's their baby so and it's holding you back and you're throwing throwing good money at bad so sean i know you want to jump in on it but that was just something i I hear all the time i want to touch on what you're saying because i I think you're right i think the software there's a familiarity too like and and what's what the problem is a a lot of times when when you're talking about erp systems or foundational like accounting packages and systems the people who use that are, are the most are usually the people who are in charge. And if you're talking about uh, change management, sometimes the hardest people to convince to change are the ones that are in charge. They want to do things the way they want to do it. So it's usually like everybody else around them sometimes has to uh, modify their approaches or, or work with them to be able to handle it the right way. But sometimes that is the hardest bandaid to rip because the people who have to do it are the ones signing the checks. So there's there's a certain change management up and there's also a certain change management down. But if you aren't willing to kind of make those changes, you're putting brand new tires on a on an old rusty car. Um, yeah. with some of the things you can add on to it. No, Sean, actually I, I'm glad you brought that up about about upward change management. And I think that here at DSI, we've been in, incredibly fortunate to have a senior leadership team that um basically our philosophy has been we, you know, 
we've said it many times, we want to be leading edge, not bleeding edge. We we don't mind trying some some things. We, we, we may not be first, and maybe somebody else out there that's going to try it first, but we don't mind being second, and we don't mind it not working, but we're not afraid to let go of those sacred cows, and we did have some for sure, but it, it really took that upward change management, as you addressed right there, of Again, that's that philosophical change we made several years ago to say we have got to embrace change and we've got to be ready for it. And just I will honestly tell you, just now, meaning 2023, I feel like our corporate culture up and down, it's not 100 percent, but it, it's more than than not, is comfortable understanding that. Our industry is changing and we have to change along with it. We can't just say, no, we're not going to do that, but we've got to be ready. And, you know, our shops, our field, our our leadership within uh, all kinds of different groups are now saying, how can we help make us better and and get us the tools we need to be uh, better craftsmen and a better company and provide at the end of the day, our customers a better product. That's really what we're after. Exactly, um, and yeah, and you have to kind of address that that first. You know, the the one thing I want to kind of, and I don't want to talk about ERP all day, but one thing I do want to kind of mention as we as we kind of finish this up, as people are looking to um, overhaul and make changes to their ERP or their even or their accounting platforms, um, the one mistake that you you sometimes see made is people are um, adjusting to their needs right now and not to what their needs they should forecast five or ten years from now. And I, and I say this, uh, upgrade to where you want to be in five to 10 years as to where you are now, because you do not want to have to hit that same uh, wall again in a couple of years and, and have to go through another ERP overhaul. Because cause what happens is you're trying to address too much change too fast. And, and maybe, Will, you can address that part. How do you kind of manage the pace of change so that it's not too many new things at once? Uh, you're doing things like what do you think the right pace is of of major kind of uh, process changes for your organization? Yeah, that's that's a a good topic. Uh, it's been a lot of lessons learned for us because we've done it wrong several times. Um, you know, and it really depends to me on who the audience is and what it is that you're you're trying to change. You know, changing. Uh, ERP is a big deal, and it took us a long time because it was it's a big product and all of those sorts of things. But we've learned that the pace of change needs to be fast within the product that you're doing, but you don't want to do too many unique things at one time. That is overwhelming, um, especially when at the end of the day, if you're impacting the guys or, or tradesmen out on the field who are trying to um, you know, put up pipe and, and duck. I'll tell you what our, our, our company presidents, all of them that have been in that role have told me is, look, we're, we're not a technology company with a construction division. We're a construction company with technology to support that effort. And we work really hard at it, but the pace of change is such that if, if we are grossly negatively impacting our ability to put pipe and duct in place, then we need to back off of what we're doing. So I don't have a hard and fast answer, Sean, to say it's got to be one product per month. One, one yeah, one or two. Exactly. But we, we really take it case by case and say, okay, who, who are we dealing with um, and how much are we asking them to do, right? Like, is it a massive change or is it some small tweak where, hey, we're just going to turn this screw to the right one more half turn and it's okay and everybody's fine, Um, or are we radically changing processes out in the field? That would be a slower process. But like I said, one of the things that's happened that's actually very encouraging for me as a a technology leader is field embracing um, change. And I think there's a, a real misnomer in our industry, a misunderstanding, if you will, that People who work in the field or the shop don't want to do things any different than they, they've they always done. I mean, I, we've just found that not to be true. Sure, you're going to have a, a holdout here or there. Uh, but if you give a, a, a guy or a, a lady out in the shop or the field a, a, a better tool where they're, they can do their job more effectively or safer, they're absolutely going to embrace that change and, and be a part of doing that. So I think it's how you present it. I think it's how you... Um, 
include people who are going to be a part of the change. And when I talk about lessons learned, for me personally, that was a big one. That used to be we thought, okay, let's just take this from the top and we're just gonna we're gonna shove it out there and shove they're gonna do it because we told them they have to. And man, no, never, ever will we make that <laughs> mistake again. So it's who when I said that earlier, who who are we impacting? Bring them in. Let them be a part of that team and help you understand what it is they actually need to be successful. Sitting in this office right here, I may not know what a guy out, you know, standing on a lift, hanging a big heavy pipe needs to be successful. I need to go ask him. And that mm-hmm. that was that's important. And one of the best practices I've seen in that kind of regard is uh, a research and implementation team. Um, and they research multiple things, multiple products, multiple softwares, and they use it kind of as a cooling pond. Um, and they don't try to implement everything at once. They implement um, not just like when they think it's ready, but at a pace that they all agree on. Okay, they're ready for this. Not only is a product fully cooked, um, but our, the, our, our actual employees, our, our workers are ready to kind of be able to adapt to it. And if like you have a, two or three project management things coming down at the same time, then you say, well, let's just, let's just put that, that second thing that we were talking about implementing back in the cooling pond and let's look at rolling out and implementing something else now that might impact a different set so that we're not hitting the same people all at the same time. But what yeah. it also lets it do is it lets it um, not get that first failure nearly as much either. Because if you have that first failure with a product that's not fully cooked, it is hard to get it back in when it is cooked. I mean, yeah. it's really hard to get that rolled out again the second time. It, it is. And they, th- whatever group you're working with, um, even though they may not say the words out loud, they they don't trust you. If you, if you keep coming at them with half-baked ideas and things that kind of work, you've lost their trust and it's going to be harder to do things in the future. And so I, yes, we, we do a lot of that sort of incubation where we, we work, we're, we're fortunate in that we're, we're such a big company that we can pick pockets to try things. And we know those groups that have real, you know, uh, people who are willing to try some things for us and just, and we will take them and we'll say, Hey, tell us how this works before we take it company wide, because, you know, we, we, we work, several million man hours a year. I don't want to mess any of that up. Yeah. You hit on a couple of things, right? That's the humanity and change management. Like you don't want to talk ERP. So it doesn't sound like a cool thing. Change management isn't a cool thing. <laughs> and then understanding the humanity that you're impacting in change management is huge. I, I talk about this a lot. And I think anybody listening, if you want to draw a comparison to what Will's talking about, just imagine as new tools come out right? New heavy tools that help us with installing that do those kind of things. You wouldn't just send them out to the field and ask how it went. You'd bring them in, you'd engage them, you'd understand, does it fit with the work that we do? Oh, hey, this is a great tool, but it does this and we actually don't do that. So why would we need that? I mean, I've seen that tons of times where it's like, hey, we have this great piece of software and it's like, we don't have that problem. That, that our problem is over here, you know, so so it's got to be around solving the problem and including the people. The interesting thing that you got there, too, is that, you know, fail fast equals the speed of the innovation that you set yourself up for. So I'm kind of interested in how you do that organizationally and have identified it. You've identified pockets. You know how to manage that. Is there any secret sauce that you guys are running? Do you have anything that you can share with folks that they can start to, to think about, Ooh, wait, I can learn from this. What you've got, you've got to know who within each group. So we've got people, um, in the shop, we've got some leadership out in the field and we've got some, some people in the office that we consider our sort of core group of, uh, brave souls willing to try things out that, that we bring them. And part of that is our industry is finally getting some, this would be a whole topic, a different topic to talk about, but it, it's, it's important. There's two groups of people in the trades, and I'm just going to focus on the trades. I, I have a huge amount of admiration for our trades people. I think they are tremendous craftsmen and, and women, and they do great things, but we ended up with this age gap and, and you know, you do a whole 
podcast on this missing group of people that are within uh, the trades because I feel like this, uh, we did a disservice to a lot of people for a long time by telling them they all had to go to college. And, you know, I jokingly say not everybody's cut out for the trades. Some people have to go to college. And I, I'm super proud of these younger people that are coming into the trade, but that's what's allowing us to work on some of this stuff is actually finding some people who are on the younger side of, you know, the, the, the age of the folks that work for us, but they grew up with technology. They grew up with a phone in their hand and a computer in their lap and all of these things. And uh, heck, most of them probably were playing, you know, games on Xboxes and Playstations and all of those sorts of things. So they're just not intimidated um, by those things when we bring them to them. So that's the group that we've really identified. And, and a lot of them have already moved into, you know, leadership roles. And we'll go to them and say, hey, we've got an idea. Help us vet this out. And so anyway, we meet with them, we talk to them, and we include them in all the conversations. We are not a top-down driven organization when it comes to that sort of stuff at all. We, we really listen to what uh, the groups want and we try to help them out. I think that's an interesting difference. There's a nuance in what you guys are doing there versus what others are doing, right? You're looking at those younger, more digitally enabled folks to, to get feedback, to get an understanding. They've trained under and learned from that previous generation that's still there working. But you're then not also saying, and this is the nuance, we believe that all of those craftspeople can use any of the technology that we give them. And I think other companies look for those young, digitally enabled folks and then say, okay, how do we force this? How do we, uh, well, if that's what I expect out of my kids, if that's what I expect out of my tradespeople, that's what I'm going to get, right? Because yep. that's, it's my attitude going in. And I've challenged this over and over. Like those same people that you're saying can't use technology, I guarantee you they're pulling up Waze or Google Maps or something on the way home and they're ordering Uber yeah. Eats and they're, and they're checking their Facebook or whatever it might be. And they're doing those things. So yeah. that's actually our philosophical problem. And I'm wondering, you know, where else you've seen this, you know, because you've got a shop, a field, an office. That's a heck of a, a dichotomy of different places to innovate. And, you know, has it has it proven that those that that gap exists, but that older generation to say you're seeing them use it and adopt it pretty quickly, aren't you? We we are. Um, it really began with us deciding that. I think you stated it well in that if you have the attitude that they can't, they won't. It's really that simple. And so we went into this believing we could teach anybody how to use the tools that we were going to put out there. And it's what's really led to, I think, just significant efficiency gains for us, you know, as, as we've linked these various aspects of our business together. You know, we were even told by some, you know, regional leadership, and then they weren't being negative or anything like that, but they were like, you know, old, old Johnny out in the shop, he's not ever going to do this. And it just turned out to not be true. Once that person was like, oh man, I get this. This makes, this now clicks in my head. I get it. I've done this for, you know, 25 years, but I've never done it better. And we've shown them how to do that. But, you know, one of the, the ways that we've done that is we've put them in control of their own destiny. A lot of the tools that we, we've rolled out have removed this idea that someone in the office is going to do something for me and I now can do it myself the way that I think my job, my crew, uh, myself can operate. And when someone's empowered, they embrace. And I think that's a very important distinction to make. Uh, yeah, I think that you to tack on to that a little bit, I mean, you not only, some of those people who are really reluctant or resilient against some of these new tools and stuff out there. Sometimes you have to show them, uh, or at least what's, why it's in their best interest to, to do that. And you guys uh, use a really good digital integration platform to connect your, your VDC to your fab shop to the field. Um, I was talking to a contractor just this week, and their, uh, their fab shop foreman was a little bit reluctant to it. Uh, he's only working on one project right now. And I, the, the thing I said to him, okay, how many calls do you get a day from the field? And he's like, all right, 50 to 60 a day. 
50 or 60 calls a day from the field. Um, and if you think every single one of those calls is like the, the work has stopped on whatever they're doing to get that, that call answered, you're talking at a minimum five minutes out of a day, uh, maximum maybe 10 or 15, or maybe it's even a bigger problem than that. But for the people who use some of that software that can, that can get transparency about where that project is across the site, those calls drop significantly. So I asked the guy, like, okay, how many have you gotten from that project today? He's like, I've, I haven't gotten any from that project. How many have you gotten from that project this week? Two, as opposed to the, the 20 he would normally get by that part, that, by that time during the week. I was like, can you see where I'm going with this? The more that these answers are, these questions are answered by the people on the field and the, the transparency is shared, the less that you're going to have to do your daily, like I'm answering 50 or 60 calls a day and you can get back to running your shop. Yet you show them why it's in their best interest to kind of go down that road and that they can see the light. So like, okay, what can it take to get me off the phone 50 or 60 times a day where I have to stop what I'm doing and manage these 20 different projects around the city and, and where these are in the, in the, in the process. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, what we really wanted to do, Sean, was not just give, well, the, the, the person making the decision or taking the action out in the field needed the tools in front of them to make whatever sort of software selection change, information gathering. They needed to do that where they were, not by, like you said, picking up the phone. The typical thing was to you know call detailing. What did, what did you do? What, what, what happened here? Well, now they've got all of that in front of them and we've given them... Um, I mean, it's it's not been a, a cheap undertaking, but we've given them the tools they need to where that person now standing right there has in their hand more information than they've ever had, and they can make a decision now rather than right. the phone call. They're out. I leave a voicemail. Maybe they're on vacation. I got to find somebody else, and it just goes round and round and round. But if it's in the model, if it's a if it's living and it's there, and they have access to it. I mean, it's just better. And our guys right. and, and gals out on the field appreciate that. And they're they're better at it. I mean, it's 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 been a real win for us. They don't want to stop what they're doing. They want to have the same access to the information and the answers as everybody else does. And I gotta give a lot of credit. You know, you mentioned you have a great team working over at DSI. Um, Doug Smith, who is the MEP innovator of the year right now, the, the reigning champion uh, for the MCAA MEP innovator of the year. Uh, had a lot to do with it, and he was um, kind enough to work with your your team uh, over there and your leadership to even showcase how they do it um, at our last MEP conference, which was down in Austin. So I got to I got to say thank you to you and your organization, uh, but really throw a little shout out to to your team there who is who is who's earned this title because it's not just Doug; it is your entire team that really is earning the Innovator of the Year award. Uh, Doug was just the one who who kind of led the charge with us. Um, to showcase some of that stuff. I'm super proud of the work the team has done, but um, Doug definitely has been out in front of that. That award was was well deserved, and I I certainly uh, proud of him for the the things that he's done for DSI. I'll tell you, he's taken a lot of arrows over the years for you know, <laughs> but he's never been afraid to just step. He's never been afraid to step right into the middle of things where someone may even say to him. Stay in your lane, Doug. That's not your area. Well, I, you know, he's one of the few guys I've known in my life where there is really no lane that he's willing to stay in. So you just you you, you turn a guy like that loose and you let him go, and, and good things have happened. And um, yeah, Doug sends some great stuff for us. But yes, it's 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 certainly been a team effort. I appreciate you mentioning him, though. Well, yeah. and I want I want to jump in on that because two quick things. One, a plug. So I know Doug and we actually had Doug on this other podcast I'm a part of called the construction dorks and it was on episode 12. So it's a ways back, but he was phenomenal and blew our minds. So if you guys want to hear from him, go there, but also a little teaser, we might be talking to try and get him back on in the future. Cause you know, you got to update every once in a while, but you know, bring in champions. You got to bring them in, you know, that's, that's the way it works. <laughs> right. you had the Doty already. I mean, you might yes. as well bring in the, MVP Innovator of the Year. There's not a really good phrase for that one, like like the Doty, but it's okay. Yeah, we'll we'll come up with a with an acronym for that one. But uh, this will be odd with the three of us and talking about Doug. But we're under the assumption, Will, that you know having 
um, digital enablement and detailing in the in the shop or in the office, having a fabrication shop and installing in the field is like the way. And I travel, and there is a lot of people who don't necessarily know that that is the way. So philosophically, you as an organization also had to embrace that that prefabrication offsite is the way of the future. Talk a little bit about how you had to go through that because that created its own set of changes, right? You don't do things the way you used to. No, you you don't. Uh, but we had to have the software in place that would allow us to do those things successfully, right? So, you know, we're if, if you walked our shop, you saw literally at every station there's a, a large TV or a, a digital. Uh, display of some kind that empowers somebody down there to to rotate um, a spool, to see what they're doing, to understand um, it's more than just a piece of paper, but they, you know, they, they, they can get better views on those sorts of things. And um, just to go back to a little bit what Sean was saying earlier, our, our old workflow was detailing was the gatekeeper for everything whether it was in the shop or the field. And the reason for that was, is they were the ones in the model doing the drawing and no one else had access to it. We'd print some papers out. Heck, we'd even roll them up, put a you know rubber band around them and cart them out to the field. And um, you know, as our industry was changing, we were moving away from plan and spec to design assist and design build. Those, the information on that paper was old by the time you got it to the person that needed it. And so, we, we had to do something different. Honestly, we were making a lot of mistakes. We were fabricating things that were incorrect because the change, but nobody knew it. Uh, we were ripping out installs because it was old information. Somebody picked up the wrong set of plans. I did it on accident, but they picked up the wrong role. And anyway, we had to connect those things. And, you know, it started with a change to, to Revit. Oh my gosh, you talk about a challenge, right? So we had to get out of CAD and get into Revit. And that was very hard. Uh, we're pretty darn good at it now. Um, but anyway, we we brought all that together to where what happens in detailing now is available to people in the shop and people in the field. And it's our, our coordinators who publish these models to those guys. They validate that it's like, okay, this is ready. And we hit publish and off they go. Um, and everybody's got what they need. And man, we've got, I, I don't know, more iPads than I can count. But um, it's... It, you got to do that. I mean, Jeff, to your point, if if they're, man, I don't care what size mechanical you are, electrical, whatever major trade you're in as a subcontractor, you better figure out that offsite prefab and digital connectivity is the way or you're going to get left behind. Somebody's going to come into your territory that you think you own and they are going to blow you out of the water and you just so you got to go. That's what I would tell people. Just start, start somewhere, pick, pick a project, pick a thing and go. Yeah. And, and, and you guys embrace that. I mean, I think that's interesting because you're talking about, you know, to these folks that somebody can come in and eat your lunch, right. And, and take you. And you guys talked about being a family co uh, own, you know, a uh, uh, family oriented and repeat customers and, but yet, even though you have that and you provide all that, you don't hang on to this stuff like your secret sauce. Sean talked about it. You've opened up your doors to all of us to walk your fabrication floors, to share your workflows, to do all those things. Why are you doing that? I mean, where where does that play in? How does how does that part of what you're doing and not just hanging on to it as your your uh, your special sauce? Yeah. No. So I, I do want to be clear. We. We will compete. If you come into our territory, we're gonna we're we're gonna work hard. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, we didn't get where we are um, by by being just this gentle giant. We 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 play hard, but we play fair. Um, I think that there is things that benefit the industry benefit DSI, and so when when others are able to to do well, I think it actually helps us more than it than it hurts us because if the entire industry is moving forward embracing innovation and change i think that that provides a, a better marketplace for gcs and owners and all of those things 
So as a union contractor, we, you know, we we have we have a great relationship with our, our union partners. We we love the people we get. Um, they're hard workers. They're they're well trained and they do a good job for us. But it, we have a very flexible workforce. We have some guys who are travelers. We've had some that work for us a long time. But my my point is, if I know that other companies are innovative and implementing technology, if I get a group that come from those other places to us, whether it be a short-term engagement, project-based, I don't feel like I'm going to be fighting a battle to get them up to speed to what we do. They don't even necessarily have to have the same tools. They just have to know, hey, I've done this over here. It's going to be the same at DSI, and we're just going to hit the ground running and go, and there's less of a, of a learning curve. So, I mean, it's a little selfish on our part, I guess, but at the end of the day, I think it 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 helps us, and so we're 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 happy to do it. Uh, we may not tell you everything we do, but we'll we'll tell you some of the stuff. <laughs> you get pretty yeah. close to it. But one of the yeah. things that, that I really applaud you guys for is, and you've, you've done this a few times. Um, but you, first of all, you get what you give in the industry. Um, you know, when you sure. show when you demonstrate leadership on this stuff. Uh, what you'll also find is the people are coming through and and seeing what you do are also volunteering some of the the things that they do. And nobody has solved every single problem out here. No. But having two hundred people who do roughly what you do, uh, who can say like, oh yeah, we you know we we face this this problem too. Here's how we solved it. And it might not be the the perfect answer. It might not be the right answer. But at least you at least it leads you in the right direction. Um, the other thing is like you, you talked about that. Hey, you know sometimes we're right above like farmers, you know, in, in innovation. And that stupid McKinsey report that everybody keeps, you know, <laughs> quoting ad nauseum, which is I, I, I posit wrong. But it's one of those things where if you don't start, if we don't start trying to collectively raise the productivity of this industry, um, we're we're gonna get we're gonna kind of get left behind. And I'd rather see an industry of innovators than the ones who are the laggards. Um, but it's just a really tough nut to crack. I'm actually real proud of our industry right now. I feel like that. Um... The, the, the bigger companies, and there, there are others out there that are our size, are leading the way. And we want the small to mid-sized companies to, to learn from both our successes and our failures. But I will tell you, Sean, you make a real good point. I cannot tell you how many times we've gone on a shop tour. It could be the smallest shop around. Like, what in the world is a, a DSI doing in this tiny little company shop? We've come away from that going, man, they had a great idea. Did you see what they did over there at that station? We're going back and we're doing that. It's happened more than once. And so yep. I, I'm, we're, we're super happy to, to talk to talk to people. They're welcome to come see our shop. We do tours all the time. We're, we, we, we love being um, teachers, mentors, and we love also learning. It's just who we are. Yeah, I'll take that to a to a flip side too, and I, I get this from from Sal D'Ambrosio, who's over at W M Blanchard now. Came from Armistead Mechanical. Is is that if there is somebody out there who will do it the old way, then that is still an option for general contractors, for owners to go. Oh no, we'll just do it the old way. We we always did it. So the company you might be helping is yourself because you're raising up the expectations of the industry. So you go right. the other route there. It's great. Um, great point. Yeah. Is that we, we have to do that. And ultimately that, that knowledge sharing is, is, you know, it isn't your secret sauce. Your secret sauce is you said you treat your people like family. You're not telling us exactly how you do that or what things you put in place to do that. You just do that. You can't replicate that leadership that you have in the, in the relationships that you as leaders have together that drive and thrive that company culture. Nobody's going to recreate that. That's yours. That that's your special sauce. You could write that down all you want, but I can read it on a piece of paper. If I don't, if I don't believe it, if I don't, if that's not part of me, it's just not going to happen. In fact, if you were to ask me to write down the things that we do to create that culture, I would be challenged to, to, to do that. It's just kind of is. I mean, our, when our, our like senior leadership teams meet, we would be a real hard case study for like Harvard Business Review because we don't have a mission, vision, and value statement that we plaster on the walls or that we tag in our emails or anything like that. But I cannot tell you how many people work here in all facets of our business that have been here for 15, 20, 25 years. And you don't stick around unless there's something keeping you here. It's not, 
it's not pay, it's not benefits, it's it's connectedness for lack of a better term. And I think that that's that if you were to that's our secret sauce. It really is is a group of people committed to one another to doing right things and building great products. Yeah, you don't need a vision splattered out there if that's how you act, right? It's that's just right. inherent. That's how that's it is. Right. It's in your it's in your DNA. We don't we don't have it plastered on our DNA that I'm this type of person or that type of person. It just is. And and I I think a lot of people can learn from that. You know, I I love the conversation, Sean. Any final question before we spin it? No, I say we spin it. All right. Well, Will, it's been awesome. I'm excited for you to come along with us for the news. It's been a great interview. I highly encourage anyone to connect with Will, to connect with DSI, to learn more. They really are leading in the industry. And and thanks for coming on today. It's been awesome to interview you. You bet. I enjoyed being here. And yeah, people, people know where to find me on LinkedIn or wherever. Happy to talk to them. Yeah, it'll be in the show notes, guys, so you guys can get it there. I wish we had more time, but it's time to get into the construction technology news of the week. And I'm back with Robert Shear, VP of Strategy and Business Development for OpenSpace. There's a, a lot of reality capture out there, a lot of 360 products out there. What really sets OpenSpace apart? From the start, we really focused on speed and simplicity. If you want your field teams to use stuff, it better be easy, it better be fast. And so our focus is 100% on making life easier for people to build stuff. All our advanced tech is wrapped in a really super simple experience. It just works the first time every time. And it works at the speed of construction, which to us means getting things turned around in you know, less than an hour so that if you walk at seven in the morning by eight o'clock, you can share that with your team and you can coordinate work and kind of track issues. Awesome. Well, so who is really the open space product focused at? Is Are you looking at trade contractors, general contractors, owners? Who's your real, you know, users? Yeah, it's really all of the above. You know, I mean, I think we started focusing on GCs and I'd say that's probably most of our users, but now we've got real strong adoption with with trades, uh, a lot of owners are writing and writing to the spec for the project. With the GCs, it's a lot of capturing maybe every other day, once a week to really provide that context for the team. Trades tend to use them a lot more actively. They're using them to track progress, track team productivity. And then owners, again, love to have that sort of oversight and visibility into the, into the project. Uh, we've got 100,000 active users on the platform. We've got our users have captured over 10 billion square feet in 70, over 70 countries. And more and more of our customers are moving from using open space on one or two projects to really using it across their whole project portfolio. That's awesome. Where can they learn more about open space? Yeah, I'd point them to two places. Uh, one is openspace.ai. Check it out, look around. If you want to learn more, there's request a demo buttons all over the place, click that. The other one is we're going to be at a ton of trade shows and conferences both sort of national ones like AU and Groundbreak, but also regional ones. So if you go to openspace.ai slash events and see a calendar and, you know, stop by and say hi. All right, Sean, this is an interesting one. Not that I allow things here, that, that, that's a weird <laughs> statement for me, but, but Sean put in an article that was already put in, but then he said, wait, 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 wait. I want to do a little... Well, you didn't want to call it a rebuttal, but I'm going to call it a rebuttal. It's, it's a, a rebuttal. It's, it's, no, it's, it's just a, a rebuttal. It's, <laughs> it's just, we're just going back to it. So you guys don't know what we're talking about. Will it's does. A, it's a Sean, back. what are we to, It's what a we... callback, not a rebuttal. All right. It's um, a callback. But, but Tannis, Tannis found this great article on LinkedIn. And it was really about, um, I think it was from Fast Company that was talking about these inflatable fabrication shops that were being uh, erected onto job sites. Uh, so basically it was on-site, off-site fabrication. Uh, and you know, the, the idea of them is, is sound. And I like the idea of them because if you're talking about less material handling, there, that is a real element to how much productivity gain you can get into a, a construction project. But my, the, the only thing I, I kind of had is a bit of a pushback on the idea that you can just have as many of these things on as many places as possible. And you can be just as productive as you'd be on a full, full term offsite fabrication uh, plant that you might have for your, your business. So, you know, we've got, we've got DSI here and they've got a great fabrication facility. They do millions of pounds of sheet metal a day. They do plumbing, they do fabrication, but to each one of these things, it takes a, not only just a large amount of heavy equipment to be able to do it right, but also the people who have been doing it forever. You have to have the right fab shop foreman who has that mentality. You can drive that out of the employees and you have to have the right craft workers who can do this the right way. 
who have that fabrication mentality and not necessarily the ones who are doing the installation or the assembly on the field. It's a totally different mentality. That was my only bit of pushback on that, Jeff, is that this sounds great, but there, there are a couple caveats that you might want to get into. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we've, it's kind of cool for you to do this now because Will's kind of gone over all the philosophical pieces, some of the technology and innovation, some of the connectivity pieces, and, and you did it, you, you, it, and you called it out. I don't even think when I read this that I read to the bottom and there was that whole part about, oh, you can just take these field workers and put them into the fab shop. I wasn't thinking of it that way. And I remember back to this curve that Jonathan Marsh and Josh Bone used to just hammer down that like the first job that you do prefabricated, the cost is actually higher, right? Because it's a, it's a, it's a scale and efficiencies where it comes down. Right. So if that's how you're approaching this, you're going to be actually more expensive every time. And that thing's not cheap, right? So I, I can see this now and, and I'll pose this to you in a second here, Will, is that for those that are doing offsite manufacturing and, and prefabrication, this is an opportunity to extend to areas where currently you might not exist or um, that might be difficult to transport things. We're seeing that more and more as transportation becomes an issue. So I can see this as an extension and something you can incorporate. But yeah, when you really come back to it, it's not just, there isn't one ring to rule them all, right? There's a, there, this is a multitude of solutions. So I'm wondering, as you've seen this, Will, and heard us talk about it, what some of your thoughts are on, on exactly that. How could it be used? But also, what are some of the drawbacks? I mean, it's interesting. I, I definitely think there's opportunity. And the example I'll give you is some things that we're doing. We've got some really large scale um, really massive facilities being being built, uh, one in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and one on the East Coast. And uh, we recognized that we didn't have fabrication shops that were close enough to those facilities to be efficient because of just simply the cost of transporting material. The more times you touch it, just it, it becomes exponentially expensive to, to do that. So we're not really doing inflatable um fabrication facilities, but we did find temporary locations that were much closer to those uh, job sites to where we can minimize those, those things. Uh, but we're big believers in, you know, we want to build as much as we can in the shops and as little as we can in the field. It's safer, it's cleaner, it's all, all of those things. But I, I, I do disagree with this idea that um, anybody from the field can be pulled in and be successful at, at fabrication. I, 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 we move our, even though these are temporary facilities, we take some of our best people there and we say, you're going to man this place for a while because um, it is a different mindset to, to build things in a shop versus installing them in the field. There's no doubt about it. Right. And you have like this elite level of craft worker who has almost earned that place. Um, and position, you know, because you want the, the, the guys who, who do it the best to be doing it the most. There's, there's this really simplistic way of looking at it, but um, it, it's not to say that everybody couldn't fabricate it. You wouldn't get some productivity gains. You definitely would get productivity gains by having on site. I just don't think that it's as, as high of an expectation level as people can, can assume, uh, because I don't think you could say like, hey, look, if we're getting this level of productivity in our offsite fabrication facility we have now, Let's have 12 of them in every single project set we have around the city, and we will be just that productive. There's going to be a modifier there that, that people have to kind of factor in. And sometimes you will be better off just using the better facilities, the better flow rate, the better the process, the better manpower, the better uh, uh, foreman who, are, who can run these shops the best way. Yeah, Sean, I mean, like our facility here in Buda, we, I mean, it does all, just about all the fabrication for the Austin area and San Antonio. So it's not like we have a giant shop in every city that, that we're in. We support massive regions with big fabrication facilities. And I think you made a good point. The very best trades, crafts people that we can find because they're just really good at what they do. And we want them to do as much of it as, as we can get them to do. Yeah. Uh, well, it was a great, um, well, we didn't call it a rebuttal. What do we call it? <laughs> it's not a rebuttal. It's a callback. It's a callback. It's a callback. All right. Well, it was a good callback. I like it. I like this little callback, this little challenge I have going between the co-hosts here and the people joining us. It's It makes it more of a conversation. So as Tannis is listening in, she'll sure, certainly come to you on LinkedIn or wherever to talk about more of it. 
I'm going to jump us into our next article. And the next article today comes from a good friend of mine, a good friend of here at the, at the crew, Taylor Cup, who recently joined Hexagon. Uh, he shared this close the data leverage gap with construction automation. And they released this great study that you can go and get, and it's a blockbuster white paper, basically on the data gap. And, uh, you know, really took a lot of time with FMI to get over a thousand technology leaders and commercial GC firms in the US, the UK and Australia, although this is heavily US, you know, got most of the replies if you look at it. And what I love too is that, hey, look, they went through the process of giving us the data behind it. I've seen a lot of these studies and then you look and it comes down to like 20 people answered it. Well, that's not very useful. So this I think is a useful sample size. And it says right away, the data leverage gaps emerging between the vast amount of data generated throughout the lifespan of a building project and the data actually used to generate valuable insights that improve project performance. I would also say that if you look at the scale of things, uh, the leading companies are creating more of a gap and, and bridging that gap. So if you're in that smaller world, it's time to think about it. Some of the highlights. 84% of firms are using autonomous technology in their operations which is awesome. Project management flows are, uh, are the highest. 32% use autonomous project management tools, billing, scheduling, and only 16.5% use fully autonomous robotics. But the interesting thing is that the opposite is true of the view of it. Nearly 40% of tech leaders mainly associate autonomy with equipment. So when you think about autonomous vehicles, you think about the spot, you think about uh, dusty robotics, that's what they're thinking about. Only 10% consider it AI, indicating there's a disconnect between how people think of autonomy and what they're actually doing. And most of these leaders, 60%, think it gives them a competitive edge, higher profitability, sustainability, and a better experience for their owners. Um, that's just some of the highlights of the of it itself. I think the data gap, the data conversation, the usability is huge. So, Sean, I'm just kind of interested in when you hear a couple of those highlights, where it takes you. The big company, small company differences. That that's that's the thing that kind of concerns me most. And I and I does. It's not to say that um, I'm pulling for either one, but I do think I, you want small companies to be able to compete. And it's hard to say that they'll ever have the resources that it takes to be able to do it. I think that they have a slight advantage in the fact that they can be a little bit more nimble in implementing new technologies to, to bridge that gap. Um, but it's hard to compete with, with the larger companies who have like the manpower and the staff that can kind of research and, and involve and, and even purchase seats on some of the equipment or some of the software that can do it. Um, but I, I do want to say, like, don't don't give up all hope. If you're a mid to small size company, you can research and implement so much faster than any large company can. And I'm sure Will can attest this, and you can do even from the ERP comments and statements. Mm -hmm. A small ERP implementation is manageable. A large company like ERP implementation is a huge endeavor. Um, so I'd say like there, there is a little bit of catch up that can be made there. Nimble is not always a word I would use to describe us. I mean, it, we're, we're a big, we're a big ship and it's hard to turn it sometimes. And so, but I do worry about the cost of innovation, particularly around autonomy that is going to hurt small to mid-sized firms. And I, I do worry about that. And I, I think they play a super important part in our, um, in our marketplace. I mean, we, we DSI, we, we don't want to, we, we don't want to do every mechanical job that, that comes along. We've got a certain set of jobs that fit us. And we firmly believe that there are people who can do other types of jobs better, th better than we can. But I, I worry a little bit if those smaller, more nimble companies are, are if they, man, God forbid they go away, um, it, it's going to be interesting. And so I, I don't know the answer to that, Sean. I think that's a, a, it's, it's a bit of a complex situation because we need a, a robust subcontractor um, market to solve a variety of construction projects. Got to have them. Right. But Plus, somebody's got to build it. Yeah, it's right. going to be the, the subcontract, let's be clear. Yeah. Autonomy is a real thing. I, I think it's a 
still a bit of smoke and mirrors with some of that stuff right now, but it's coming. Uh, autonomy and AI are going to, over the next five years, I think radically change who, who, who we are as an industry. Yeah, I'm a little bit more worried about the AI than the autonomy element of it because I haven't seen like anything that I see like, oh, you have to get this when it comes to any kind of autonomous product yet. I mean, Jeff, I mean, can you? I know you don't want to play favorites or or, or say anything, but have you seen anything like, oh, I think every contractor out there needs this? No, honestly, I think usually when you have that space, there's going to be a consolidation. There's there's some of them. Like I th I think look, eventually you're a commercial contractor. Um, or a large MEP, you're going to have to have a layout robot of some sort that does it for you, whether you're going to pick your flavor that's out there right now, I think you're going to have to, um, I think you're going to have to, if you're a drywall contractor, use things like canvas and, and I'm sure canvas will have somebody come after them soon. I'm not going to play favorites. You're right. But I think there are, there are some clear winners. Um, you're also going to want to invest in those that are going to take you into the future too, right? It's not just what they do today. It's what they're going to do tomorrow. That's the, the dusty robotics model. Or, uh, if you think about Argyle with their reality capture, or, uh, visualization in the field, mixed reality, you got those kinds of things that really bring a level of autonomy of building to the field. The interesting thing for me, Will, is that while I, while Sean said that, I actually think this is the opportunity for small companies to shoot the gap. There is a number of small companies who will batten down the hatches as we come into a downturn. They'll board up the windows. They'll, they'll turn off any upgrades. They'll cut their budget as much as they can. We're already hearing this, by the way, from IT folks that are trying to protect their budgets. And they'll miss the opportunity to shoot the gap. And when they pull down the windows, they're going to realize their competition is way down the line because that's the time to invest. But it takes guts, leadership, and an investment in that future and understanding a philosophy of where you're going to go. So they can learn a lot. DSI was small at one point, right? You said that and, and yeah. you, got big, you got big fast and you're not sitting on your laurels. So I think that's interesting. Um, all things considered, though, I'm going to use this as like a, I love a good segue. There's a number in here that I'm going to let you to think about for a second. And it shows you the, the average size of these companies they were looking at. But in the next three years, the construction industry is planning to make significant investments in autonomous technology. 7.1 million is the amount the average firm plans to invest over the next three years which equates to, as an industry, $162 billion. Now, I'll let you go look at that because my next one actually is an homage to Tannis because, by the way, Tannis' LinkedIn feeds, one of my favorite places to go read things. You yeah. said this earlier. I, I don't want to pick up fight with Tannis. She's, she's awesome when it comes to that. So she's great at, at, at finding these articles. I think I think what I need, Tannis, is your AI around whatever your Google news feed is so I can read this stuff ahead exactly. of you and be on the same page. But I thought this was really, really interesting because it talks about the demand for AI-enabled startups deploying technology for the built world soaring globally with startups raising a collective $12.3 billion in the last three years, according to a new report by the construction technology venture capital firm, AO PropTech. And we have surpassed FinTech in that investment. Think about that for, for a second. Where in the world did we think we would be leading FinTech in something like AI, in something like the leveraging of that process? I think that goes to show sort of the enormity of it, Sean, that, that AI, yeah, autonomy and auto and, and automation is huge, but AI is this new frontier that I think is, is going to be very interesting in the next three to five years. What are your thoughts on that? That just that, just how substantial that is. I, I, I feel like FinTech will catch up if not surpass only because there's such motivation there and there's less regulation. Um, you know, we have to worry about building codes and standards. Uh, FinTech does, I mean, there are, there's obviously some organizing and governing bodies, but there's a lot more motivation and with direct, you know, financial benefits, obviously, if you can use some of those things. Um, but I do think that there is, you know, with with the success of something like chat, G, uh, GTP or GPT, um, a lot of companies are saying, well, how do I just, how do I build an API in 
to do this. And there's a lot of opportunity there. If you think across the board of all the different construction processes that you could just take off your plate if there was some way of, of automating that, like you will find a lot there. That there's a lot of meat on that bone. And I, I, you can see like in the next four or five years. In fact, I'd say like, I bet within two years we have maybe like more than a dozen companies that are saying that they can do something that is automated based on some AI uh, that will, that, that we're doing today manually still. Yeah. Uh, I think it's interesting. Will, I'd love to know kind of, cause you're it's part of your job, right? You're not going to, you're not going to tell me, Oh, I'm chat GPT and I'm double down on this way. You're looking at the future as you look three to five years. And as DSI looks at this philosophically, what are some of the conversations? What are some of the places your head is going around AI? We have talked about it. Um, it is going to be very disruptive uh, for our industry. There's, there's no doubt about it. But disruptive in, a, I think, a very good way. I, I, I sort of, I maintain when I talk to people that I don't really think there's anything harder in this world to do than build a big building, because there's, I mean, there's just so many moving parts from trades, GC, owner, engineer, suppliers, all of these things, and they operate very independently. Like there's a thousand plates are spinning and none of them are connected. They're still all very individual. And so I, I, I guess the best way, I, I here's my example I'll give you. The very best uh, world-class general contractors that we work for, the very best thing that they do is maintain control of the project from a scheduling perspective, uh, safety, all of those things. But the ones that get sideways, they get sideways because something not known, and this is going to sound, something not known happens that changes the dynamic of the whole thing. A delay in a product, um, a trade falling behind, but our industry is still very guilty of reacting rather than planning. And so where I see AI, and I'll talk about just DSI now, is understanding that from the moment a request for a product is placed and it goes through purchasing to be bought from a supplier that then gets shipped back to us, we're still today reacting to that. Where AI for us and what we're talking about is how can we know ahead of time, quantities available to us, delivery times available to us. And it's it's dynamic and it's changing. And we actually see like big boards up on the wall where it says this order is due tomorrow and these three guys are going to work on that when it comes in. It's going to be delivered to the site on this day. That's where AI looking at a variety of data points that are hard to connect Mm -hmm. and making sense of those things, right? That That's where we're talking about uh, taking that and scheduling is an, another one. Just good Lord, how do you schedule these things based upon deliverables and availability? And man, it's a lot of guesswork, honestly, these days. I mean, yeah. I hate to tell you, but it is. I'd love to see some of the AI take the, the more scut work out of the business, like just RFP submittals, like the, the paperwork that always has to be done um, but you could always that to me that's almost just like just basic programming. If you want to like add a, a layer of AI onto it, you'd love to see like you know taking off what Will said like some some forecasting about like okay if I know that there's 20 projects in the city and there's a heavy amount of plumbing that's going in there, that the inventory of copper at the supply houses is probably going to drop down. So we need to order ours by this date or else we're going to be short on the number of 90 degree copper elbows or something like that. Like if if there's a way to kind of leverage all industry-wide knowledge and inventories from from players that i think would be the real kind of benefit because otherwise that's the stuff that causes the delays you're talking about it's the unknown unknown if you can try and get more of that unknown unknown to at least known um it'll really kind of help everything out yeah i've been thinking about this a lot lately and there and sean you're on a couple of these strings with me where you know it's like oh it's the end of humanity it's gone we uh -huh. can't do it and and it's not um we've said that about a lot of things will i think you hit on something there too that that i want to talk about is that like 
there is this disparate group, right? It takes all those different spinning plates and we don't really connect them and we don't really understand it. And there's this opportunity to use the AI to connect a lot of the, the known unknowns so that we can put it through a lens as teams and those great general contractors can connect you guys better, can connect the trades to the owner, to the facility, and we can continue to grow the complexity of what we're doing, right? The complexity has not changed, is not gone away. It's actually increasing and it's exponentially going to continue to increase. That's just the laws, right? That's the way it goes. But in your example, like even if you got all your data points, you're still not going to know if there's a shipping issue that's generally backing up the ability for anything to get into the country or to provide the raw materials, right? Those are big data sources that AI is great at going and knowing about and then coordinating with the info you already have so somebody can go, oh, wow, we spec this, we're seeing this, here's an alternate and an alternate manufacturer or place we can go get it or a, or a replacement, et cetera. Wow, then we can sit down and we can say as a team, okay, we're not gonna be able to get that. I'm gonna use like this lighting can't get here. Are these other lightings within spec, do they meet what the owner values and delivers for that project? And, or is it going to compromise it? What, what do we need to do? The human involved in that value will never change. Yep. And that's the cool part, right? And then ultimately the value... It's the people who use the facilities, right? You're talking about hospitals. You're talking about stadiums. You're talking about infrastructure. Great stuff. Right. So maybe there's an opportunity for us to do it that way. Yeah. yeah if you can proactively get an alternate, you know, option out there when you know that like, Hey, this is going to be six months from now, but we're not going to be able to, there's going to be a shortage of this. We're not going to have this, but we do think we can have this alternate there. Can we get that approved just as a backup in case we need to and just fast track it a little bit? Well, that was, a, that was another good one. Um, and I'm going to switch us to a final one here quickly. JP Morgan Chase calls managing directors back to the office full time even on Fridays. <gasps> I, I wanted to throw this one in and I'm going to call it out a little bit. JP Morgan Chase, I think you're being a little bit um short-sighted. Uh, I think you're being driven a little bit by the facilities that you're building. And I do agree with you that some of the Zoom things are real and you can't solve a lot of that. And there are limitations. Um, and, you know, they have some ways that they can handle what you have to do that somebody can be a hybrid work and they're looking at this or that. And I, I really think they're missing the boat here, that there is somewhere between COVID complete remote and pre-COVID, complete office, very little hybrid, and this hybrid world that works going forward, right? And um, I just don't like ultimatums, and it's all of their managing directors. So I just wanted to throw that since I had two leaders that have, you know, you very unique. By the way, if you're listening, I, I'm stealing Will's earlier quote about, you know, some people need to go to college because they're not ready for the trades. I'm totally stealing that. We're here. We're, <laughs> we are hybrid mostly. So, uh, and if you want to go to the greatest places on the planet and build things, well, you can come into our world. So, but I'm interested in what, you know, Will, you might have to think about, you know, the hybrid environment and your experiences. Yeah. I mean, obviously with construction, you can't, not all jobs can be worked from home. Right. I mean, right. So, but there are some, and what we learned in COVID, we, we learned a couple of things. Uh, one, we can be successful with people not uh, sitting in an office all day. And I'm going to get to why that matters here in just a second. But we also learned that there are just some things that are better when we're together. Part of it for us, I talked about that culture of family. It's hard to build that culture if you've got a, a significant percentage of your workforce that's not there with you. Um, and so that that's hard. So that's not to say that that is applicable to everybody. We found that it was applicable to us. But where we landed was, and I'll talk specifically about our VDC group, we really didn't know how that would go. Uh, but we, we found that um, there are a vast majority of them that can be as far as just 
X amount of drawing per day, whatever that is, they, they can do that well at home and in the office. Now, we've pretty much brought everybody back to the office, but what, we, what we've what we done is, I don't want to say hybrid, it's more flexible. That's the other term Flex. that flown, flown, flies around out there. But I would much rather give a person the opportunity to say, hey, I, I've got something that's come up. Would you mind if I work from home tomorrow? I, I we, we could be jerks about that and say, no, you're either not getting paid or you got to take a vacation day. I don't know what purpose that serves. So our answer generally is that's fine. And I'd rather get five or six, you know, good hours out of them rather than taking a day off or having a frustrated employee that felt like they had to come into the office. And so that's a very long winded answer to say, I think it depends on the company, but for us, we love the ability of saying, we prefer you in the office, but we understand when you can't be, we've given them the tools to be successful from home. So, you know, maybe I don't have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> no, you do, Sean. What's, what's do. your view of it? <laughs> See, here's my thought. I think every industry is different. Every company is different. Every, every organization is different. You mentioned financial management and financial services. Um, uh, you see a lot of stuff in the tech industry, and the, I think one of the issues in the tech industry in general is they they staffed up fighting for manpower so hard, and you know they they were probably looking for a way to reduce their total number of staff because they're trying to get rid of some of the excess ways of doing it. And one of the ways that they determined was a good way of of, of cutting back a little bit was just saying like, okay, we're going to force people back in the office, knowing that let's see five, 10% of their staff will never want to go back in the office. So they, they used it as a, as a methodology to, to maybe get rid of a certain percentage of their workforce. And it's, and it's a really hard cut, cutthroat way of looking at it. Um, but for our industry, like there is, you need some collaboration time. And if you feel like you can do it in a virtual status, that's great. Sometimes, you know, but if you look around like a, usually a VDC team, how many times do you see guys t like peeking over the the, the side and, and talking to friends like, hey, how do we run this drain line now? Or what did you do to this last thing? And you just need sometimes those little quick answers that is just more efficient in an office format, especially if it's um, people who have been do haven't been doing it for 20 years. Um, if you have somebody who know how to run pipe, know how to run duct, you know, know how to run, you know, uh, plumbing, then it's then they might have the answers a little bit more more at the at their cells, but you hate to to kind of see people silo off and never be able to kind of get that 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 community that you you, you go for there. Yeah, I, I'd like to double down on that one too, Sean. And what what I goes to for me consistently is intentionality. There has to be an intentionality and a level of autonomy for teams. So you mentioned it, Will, the VDC team, and Sean, you said the same thing. And and Sean, your example, I'll challenge that like. If I am intentional and I understand the leadership and, um, and, and I mean leadership at the small level of that VDC team and the makeup of that VDC team, I might know that, hey, they're just as great at slacking each other. And in fact, they're sitting across from each other slacking and they could just stand up and peek over and they won't there because that's the way they work. And so there's an intentionality to, okay, can they do that? Yes, that's their work. But then will you can't replace the culture, the feel, those things that you get, that experience, that, that, that secret sauce without it. So intentionally people need to work together. They need to be in those places together. So for me, it's just about, uh, instead of a blanket, it's, it's a level of understanding and intentionality around what we do going forward is how we're going to do it. Cause we've opened up Pandora's box and I quite like it. You know, I think like you said, Will, not only would you like to have them work, you in many cases need to, right? We all do, right? We don't have enough people to do all of the work. So if you can provide them a chance to see their kid's soccer game, provide them a chance to get medical treatment and still be productive when they want to, like, I still want people to take the time they need all of that. And you're, yeah. you're, you're not saying that, but you're saying, Hey, this is something I have to do. And I'd still rather be productive. Hey, we all win. So. There's an opportunity there. So with that, I wanted to wrap it up. You guys can check out all those new stories in the notes. Um, we'll have them for you in the show notes. I want to thank again, Will, for joining me today and and really providing so much to the news as well, man. You, It's been great to meet you and great to, to have you on the show. Enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. 
Yeah. And Sean, as always, bringing great guests, bringing a good time. Can't wait to see you out there in person in the future soon. Yeah, I think we're going to be at So Built together coming up in June, which will, I guess, be about a month after this thing airs. So looking forward to yeah. seeing you down there. Looking forward to seeing yeah, you looking there. forward to seeing you at So Built. Thank you for tuning in today to geek out for our interview with Will McManus. To read all our news stories, learn more about our guests, and to listen to this show, visit thecontentcrew.com. This is The Content Crew signing out. Until next time, enjoy the ride and geek out.